Good day, Miss Bubaness. Our names are Xiao Jia Zheng, Hong Xian, Clifford Tiao Yang Lei, Wei Bin Hao, Liang Guo Jie, and Li Mui Jie. Hello, welcome to our video presentation. But before that, remember to subscribe and like for our video. Prior to 1932, in the absence of privity of contract, no duty of care is formed. There is no test to establish duty of care until 1972, a landmark decision in the case of Donahue against Stevenson construct a general principle on a duty of care. Duty of care can be defined as a legal obligation that is owned or due to another that needs to be satisfied. In other words, an obligation for which somebody has a corresponding right. Generally speaking, a person owes a duty of care to those around him or her, for example, a duty to act reasonably. Duty of care can be determined by using objective tests, which is the reasonable man test. Now, I am going to talk about the historical development of duty of care, which is the pre Hill. Tracing back to 1842, in the case of Winterbottom versus Wright, the court held that although the defendant contracted to maintain the male coach in the safe condition and undoubtedly failed to do so, the duty was owned under the defendant's contract with Postmaster General. The defendant owed no duty to the claimant because the duty could not extend beyond the contractual one. It was considered that to allow the claimant's claim to succeed who have a duty to help in all circumstances will harm a court. There will be no limit to the number of claims that might arise. Therefore, the claimant claim failed. Heavens Against Panther case was the first attempt to formulate duty of care. In this case, the court held that the defendant's liable and dicta of Mr. Brett stated that whenever one person is by circumstance placed in such a position which regard to the another, that everyone of ordinary sense who did think would at once recognize that if he did not use ordinary care and skills in his own conduct with regard to those circumstances, he would cause danger or injury to the person or property of the other. A duty arises to use ordinary care and skills to avoid such a danger. This case established that under certain circumstances, one may own a duty to another even there is no contract. However, this case later distinguished by Leve against Grob in 1893. The following case to be discussed is Dominion Natural Gas Co. Limited against Collins. Here, it was established that those who send forth inherently dangerous articles were, were subject to a common law duty to take precautions. Though there was no relation of contract between the plaintiff and the defendants, it was held that what the duty is real vary according to the subject matter of the things involved. It has, our, however, again and again be held that in the case of articles dangerous in themselves, such as loaded firearms, poisons, explosives, and other things in Judem generis, there is a peculiar duty to take precaution of impose upon those who send forth or install such articles when it is necessary of the case that the other parties will come within their proximity. The events of the case took place in Scotland in 1928. Mrs. Donahue went to a cafe with her friend. Waiter! Yes, yes. Welcome, welcome to my shop. What would you like, miss? I would like to have a ginger beer. A ginger and beer? And an ice cream. Oh, okay, okay. And an ice cream for my friend here, please. Okay, what about you? Her friend bought her a bottle of ginger beer and ice cream. Hi, your order is here. The ginger beer came in an opaque bottle so that the contents could not be seen. Mrs. Donahue poured half the contents of the bottle over her ice cream and also drank some from the bottle. After eating part of the ice cream, she then poured the remaining contents of the bottle over the ice cream and a decomposed snail emerged from the bottle. Mrs. Donahue suffered shock and stomach pain as a result. She could not bring an action 
for breach of contract against the owner of the cafe as it was her friend that had bought the ginger beer. She then commenced a claim against the manufacturer of the ginger beer for negligence. The real significance of the case undoubtedly lies in Lord Akin's neighbour principle. What he was seeking to do was to move away from the situation by situation approach to duty of care and establish a more general approach that would apply across all situations. Such an approach could, if successful, unify the cases that had gone before and, perhaps more importantly, offer some element of predictivity in relation to cases yet to come. The terms of the neighbour principle are too familiar to restate, but it does contain within it the two key concepts which would come to dominate the 20th century negligence law. These are foreseeability, which Lord Atkins mentions expressly, and proximity, a term he does not use but which is implicit in his definition of who is law is my neighbour. In addition, Lord Atkins' judgment on the liability of manufacturers in the thought of negligence is manufacturers of products which he sells in such a form as to show that he intends to reach the ultimate consumer in the form in which they left him with no reasonable possibility of intermediate examination and with the knowledge that the absence of reasonable care in the preparation or putting up of the products will result in an injury to the consumer's life or property owes a duty to the consumer to take that reasonable care. And now, my friend Liao will be elaborating on neighbor principle. Okay, so now I will be discussing on the neighbor principle, which is developed in the case of Donahue and Stevenson by Locke Atkin. And so, what is the neighbor principle? It is an objective test to determine the existence of duty of care in the parties. And it extended the thought of negligence beyond the thought freezer and the immediate party. Lord Atkin in Donahue and Stevenson said that the rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law. You must not injure your neighbor. And the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, receives a strict restricted reply. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which can reasonably foresee would likely injure your neighbor. So who then in law is my neighbor? The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. So based on this statement, a neighbor is someone who can be directly affected by one's actions and the actor should take into account whether his or her actions will affect them. It should be taken into consideration that would a reasonable man who is in the same circumstances as the defendant foresee that his conduct will adversely affect the plaintiff? If the answer is no, the plaintiff is not a neighbour, then there is no duty of care. But if the answer is yes, the plaintiff would be a neighbour of the defendant and the latter will owe of duty of care to the former. And this neighbour principle laid down the grounds for the development of modern law of negligence and was subsequently further developed in further cases. The neighbour principle subsequently laid down the grounds for the development of the modern law of negligence and it was further developed in more future cases. Next, Lord Macmillan on the liability of manufacturers says that a person who for gain engages in the business of manufacturing articles of food and drink intended for consumption by members of the public in the form in which he issues them is under a duty to take care in the manufacturers of these articles. That duty, in my opinion, he owes to those who intend to consume his products. His manufacturer his commodities for human consumption by reason of that very fact. He placed himself in a relationship with all potential consumers of his commodities and that relationship which he assumes and desires for his own ends imposes upon him a duty to take care 
to avoid injuring them. Lord Macmillan further examined previous cases and held that the law takes no cognizance of carelessness in the abstract. It concerns itself with carelessness only where there is a duty to take care and where failure in that duty has caused damage. Whether there was a duty to breach would be examined by the standard of reasonable person. These circumstances must adjust and adapt itself to the changing circumstances of life. The category of negligence are never closed. Lord Macmillan held that according to this standard, Stevenson had demonstrated carelessness by leaving bottles where snails could access them. That he owed Donoghue a duty of care as commercial manufacturer of food and drink, and that Donoghue injuries were reasonable for Sylvia. He therefore found that Donoghue had a cause of action and commented that he was happy to think that in relation to the practical problem of everyday life which this appeal presents, the principles of in English law are sufficient consonant with justice and common sense to admit of the claim which the appellant seeks to establish. Next, Yisien will talk about the interesting facts and significance of the case. Donoghue may not have invented the thought of negligence, but he freed the cause of action from the shackles that had inhibited its growth. It did this by opening up the field for duty of care to spread into new situations. While the neighbour principle is the most famous element of the case, it is the quotation from Lord Macmillan, another of the majority that categorise of negligence are never closed, which perhaps better caught the mood of the new departure that Donoghue marked. But as has been recognised in more recent years, the simplicity of its approach to duty is, in reality, too simple. It fails to capture all the complicated variations of fact that negligence law has had to encounter. In many ways, the modern approach is to deny the existence of any single approach to duty that works in all circumstances. There are different approaches for different contexts, something Lord Stein has called a mosaic as in the case of McFarlane against Tayside Health Board. In cases involving physical injury caused by a positive act, the neighbour principle will still work pretty well because those are the cases where foreseeability and proximity will, in most cases, get you home. Once we stray outside the spheres into liability of non-physical injuries or for omissions or for the conduct of third parties, other considerations beyond foreseeability and proximity begin to acquire greater significance. In those cases, Donahue stands as a foundation, stone upon which much more has been built. At the risk of extending the metaphor too far, the builders of negligence law have not all been working to the same plans over the years. In the years of expansion, exemplified by Ants, the case, Judges seem to view negligence as an instrument of social progress, and they themselves are crusaders for justice. It seemed that there were few wrongs which negligence could not be used to put right. This corresponded with a time when the state, in the wider sense, tended to be viewed as a device of advancement. Hey, it's your turn for presentation! Wow, really noisy la. Camera la. Wait, please, 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 wait, 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 let me get ready first. Wait, wait, wait. Did the teacher see me not anxiety? No, no. Okay. So, I'll be discussing about what happened after the case of Donahue against Davidson. So, basically, there was a case that involved ends against Morton London Borough Council, which reformed the principle. The facts of the case was that the local authority approved the building plans for a block of flats and the flats were built later that year. However, by 1970, structural movement had begun to occur in the properties, causing cracking to the walls and other damage, causing the property to become dangerous. Claimant tenants in the flat began proceedings in 1972 in negligence against them. There were two specific issues. Whether the council owed the duty of care to the claimants in respect of the incorrect depth of the foundations laid by the third party builder or whether the claim was statute barred. 
and the court held that the council may be liable in negligence, but in limited circumstances. The relevant legislative provisions with regard to inspection did not place the duty on the council to inspect the walls, but did allow it the power to, if it considered inspection necessary. Besides that, the claimant was not statute barred. The limitation period running from the date of which the dangerous state of the property became apparent. And the two stage tests came about. Stage 1. Was the harm to the claimant foreseeable, bringing him within the neighbour principle that was mentioned earlier? If yes, a prima facie duty is said to be established. Stage 2. If the answer to the above is in the affirmative, the court has to examine whether there are any considerations that may negate, reduce, or limit the scope of the duty, or the group of persons to whom the duty will be imposed. Besides that, there is also a landmark case, which is Caparo against Dickman, which has created the three section tests in establishing duty of care. But before we get there, let's have some fun. Take off this suit. Teacher, let me explain to you what it means. This test departs from Donahue against Stevenson and the Wilberforce test laid down in Ants against Merton London Borough Council, which starts from the assumption that there is a duty of care and that harm was foreseeable unless there is good reason to judge otherwise. Whereas Caparo starts from the assumption that no duty is owed unless the criteria of the three stage test is satisfied. And these criteria are foreseeability, proximity, and whether it is fair, just, and reasonable to impose such a duty. Yet, this approach has been critiqued by overcomplicating the neighbour principle in Donahue. Moreover, there is an abundance of case law which moves away from the Caparo test altogether. In conclusion, the case of Donahue and Stevenson is one of the most influential and important cases that helps to develop the law of talk in the English law. This case established a precedent that will be followed by numerous other cases in the future. The main takeaways of this case is the development of negligence, duty of care, and the neighbour principle. These rulings not only determine that businesses would owe a duty of care to customers, it also lays down the ground for subsequent developments of the civil law of negligence in the English law. Three, two, one. Thank, Thank you, Mr.